second. Let's get the technology going here. Right. Okay. Are you able to see a screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity of asking me to join. Um, I think uh, myself and your rabbi go back a long way um, uh, to Jewish grammar days. Good morning, Rabbi Lister. Is he still there? No. Is rabbi Lister there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So I was muting. Oh, sorry. Good, good morning, Rabbi Lister. Morning, morning, morning. Okay, so we go back a long way, I think. Okay, so um, my Devar Torah today, my short Devar Torah today, is something which is um, a topic which I'm, I'm very interested in, which is uh, people and places which is connected with Tanakh. So as we're reading the Megillah on, um, we will be in the Megillah tomorrow night, so we're going to look at the um, some stuff about uh, Shushan and Shushan Habira, which is referred to in the Megillah Sesta, as you know, that's the central place location of the story took place. We'll look at some ideas about Shushan Habira and some maybe a little bit of archaeology as well um, uh, in a video if we've got a bit of time. Okay, so if you can see the map in front of you, this is a modern map. Um, and you can see there that we have the place of Jerusalem, obviously marked just to give us the, the identity. And then we've got the, the location of Shushan, which is in modern day Iran. Um, so it's in, uh, towards the south of Iran. And it's a place where um, it's been venerated by both Jews and Muslims for a very long time. The whole area, not far away, is the tomb of Mordechai and Esther. And it's also the tomb of Daniel is also not far away. And obviously, absent the political situation in Iran in the last uh, 40 years or so, um, it was a place that Jews used to visit. The Jewish community of Iran, which still exists, um, it, it regards this as a place, a holy shrine. That's the Mordechai Nesta. So Shushan is a town there. And there are two places. There's, there's a modern town, which is a few, um, about three quarters of a kilometre from the existing, from the, the biblical, the one we're referring to. And there is a, um, uh, and it's, it's known by several different names. Uh, Shush is the name that's usually seen on a map for the town of Shush, which is the town of um, very close to where Shushan, uh, which we refer to in the Megillah. So obviously we've got here, um, and the, well, the first mention in Megillas Esther is um, um, after the feast of Achashverosh, the king made the Chol Ha'am Hanimsim B'Shushan to all the people who were referred to in Shushan Habira, Shushan, and Migadol Adkotan, he made a feast for them. That's the first mention of, of Shushan in Megillas uh, Esther. Okay, but what we're going to have a little thought about is that sometimes in the Megillah it's referred to as Shushan and sometimes it's referred to Shushan Habira. Okay, and um, there's a difference between the two according to many commentaries. So if you imagine a city like Rome um, today, if anyone's been to Rome, okay, so there's the, there's the city of Rome, yes, you have, I have as well, and you see that there's the city of Rome and then in the city of Rome you've got the Vatican City, which is... Um, not comparing the identical comparison, just the general idea. So you've got, or in, I think it's in Prague, you have the city of Prague and then you have the royal city of Prague. So there seems to be that in Shushan, it's unlike in, in say London, where you've got the, all the royal palaces and places that are dotted in several different locations and they're not in a separate place. There seems to have been a Shushan, a city called Shushan, and there was a place called Shushan Habira, which was the royal city, okay, or it was a fortress within the city um, of Shushan itself. So when it talks about Shushan Habira, it's referring to um, the, the inner part of Shushan where the royal family lived. If we look here, there's a famous commentary on, on, on the Gilas Esther called Emmanuel of Rome. Look him up, you can look him up about him. Very interesting uh, life story. Okay, and he said the following, and he's not, it's similar commentaries by several different of the uh, commentators. So he says, Shushan Habira, Shushan Hu Shem Ha'er. Shushan is the name of the city. Ubira Hu Shem Chatzar Hamelach. That's the, the, the king's courtyard. Um, and he says the Yiches Kola Ir Al Habira. The city is related to the capital, and then we refer to Shushan Habira, which is the inner part of the capital. So that's the two 
parts of the story and we get a similar different thing amongst the various commentaries okay and then again the Ibn Ezra says Kiba Shah HaMelechaya Kaidem Devar Esther Al Kainhu Darba Araman. So it's telling us about Mordechai living in the or being close to that area which is close to the inner part of the city. Okay, so that is um, uh, the two of the commentaries, and maybe we'll come back. The Malbim later on in the Megillah also has a similar um, a similar kind of take on this, um, but he explains it in a little bit more detail because at the end of the Megillah. It says the Jews who are on Shushan be permitted to have an extra day. And that, says the Malvin, refers to the wider the region of Shushan rather than the actual um, the inner part of Shushan, as we as you can see there. And the next reference we find in the book of Daniel, no surprise there, um, when Daniel has a vision. And the vision, he says, I and the time you had this vision, I was in the fortress of Shushan in the province of Elam. So Elam is a place, a biblical name place. The descendants of Shame lived in that area. And um, Daniel geographically locates his prophecy to, um, to, the, to Shushan. Um, and here in the Malbim adds a little historical note. He says, in the time of Daniel, um, at this point, Shushan was not the capital city. Shushan was, the, um, was a city. And we know, we can see uh, later on, that probably King Cyrus made it into the capital city or one of several capital cities which he had. Um, so at the time of Daniel, it was a city, not Shusha, not the capital city, but it's still known as the fortress. OK, so then we come to this very strange thing. We have, we have two sources in the Talmud which deal with um, the name Shushan two different sources, and this is something that you may not know, okay, that there were several gates in the Temple Mount, around the Temple Mount area, and one of these gates was known as Shushan Habira, okay, and the question is, why was it known, what's that got to do, why was a, uh, a place in the, um, in the Temple known as Shushan Habira, so clearly we're referring to the Second Temple, okay, and we're referring to the fact that after the second temple was constructed, which is the story of Esther takes place between the first and second temples. So they come back and rebuild the second temple. And at some point there, they, um, they constructed a gate, which was called the Shushan Habira gate. It was known as the Shushan Habira gate. Um, would anyone like to suggest why? Would anyone like to suggest why it might be called the Shushan Habira gate? Come on, all these Londoners got nothing to say. It's not right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So Shushan Habira, the, the, the gate there. So the, all the gates going into the Temple Mount had different names. Okay. And this Mishnah here in Midot lists those different gates. Um, if you go to Yerushalayim today, okay, um, I was there a couple of weeks ago. If you go to Yerushalayim today, the way we generally approach the temple when we come in at the Damascus Gate, sorry, at the um, Dung Gate, when the bus comes up through the Dung Gate, that's the south side of, of the temple, okay? Many people approach it through walking through the old city to the Jewish quarter, which is from the, um, from the other side, from the western side. In the time of the temple, most people approach the city from the south, because if you know across the road from the um, from there, from where you go to the Dung Gate, there's the city, the city, what's called the Ir David, where they're doing those amazing excavations and discovering really tremendous history there. So the city of David was where the royal palace and the government was, and literally across the road was the, the temple, and at some time there was like a, a large esplanade leading from one to the other. On this side, one of the gates going in, so we can see now, we can see the Holder Gate, the Holder Gate, you can see. On the same side, there appears to have been, um, so on the southeastern side, so if you, I can't, can't do this without uh, a map really, but the Eastern Gate had a representation of the Palace of Shushan. And two reasons or three reasons are quoted for this, and I'll just share with you those reasons. Okay, and those reasons are connected with the history of when it was, of when the story took place. And the, the basic idea, if I just come back to this, I'll come back to this in a minute, but the basic idea is one of two things, either in gratitude to the fact that the kings of Persia who had their, um, had their um, palace in Shushan, as we read the story of Esther, 
they, in gratitude, in recognition of their gratitude, of, of the people's gratitude for allowing the temple to be rebuilt, the gate was named the Gate of Shushan. In the same way today, you might call, you might give somebody a name in recognition of what they've done or something that they did or could have done. So the same idea, um, it was they they would uh, gratitude. A second explanation is that it was the people should know, should have fear of who the controlling um, power was. So for a, a while, Persia was still the controlling power. They let them come back, but to remind them that they had to behave themselves and they shouldn't uh, rebel against the Persians. So therefore, they had they call the gate every time they came to the temple. They would be reminded of the fact by saying this was the gate. This was the Shushan gate, um, and that was a way of, of reminding the people. Okay, and that's. Um, and Rashi explains that further, the people were reminded that they were given permission to return to Israel by the Persian government, and they should give thanks to the government for allowing them to do so. Rabbeinu Gershon suggests that the people are expected to give thanks to God for the miracle that he performed in directing history so that King Cyrus permitted a return to Israel and a rebuilding of the temple. So again, directly connected um, with the Purim story. OK, um, and Rabbeinu Hananel develops the little point and he says to remind previous generations, why were you exiled in the first place? Why did you have to go to Babylon? So they called the gate. The first temple was destroyed because you didn't do the right thing. And therefore, when they built the second temple, they called one gate, the Shushan gate, in order to remind people, don't let that happen again. Unfortunately, of course, it did. That's that's the sad part of it. So that's the reason uh, for that. Let me just dwell with you for a, a few minutes on the name Shushan itself. OK, so what does the name Shushan mean? So this is a, a, a quote from um, a, 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 a biblical um, historian who says the word Shushan is from the word Shoshana. Right. Shoshana means a lily or a, some translated to a rose. We found it in the book of um, in the book of uh, Shir Hashirin. By the way, there's an, another connection there between um, uh, Esther and Shir Hashirin. Everybody knows that the book of Esther is the book in Tanakh that doesn't contain the name of God, but actually Shir Hashirin also doesn't contain the name of God either. OK, try and ask that for a quiz question. Most people will say, if you say, what's the only book in Tanakh, they'll say Esther. But actually, Shir Hashirim also does not contain the name of God. So in there, Shir Hashirim is said to have received its name from the abundance of the lily in its neighborhood. It was originally the capital of a country called Elam, which is or Elam, and by the classical waters of the Susis or by the classical writers, Susis or Susiana. OK, in the time of Daniel, Susa was in the possession of the Babylonians, etc. So it's connected, according to some, it's connected with the idea of Shushan, meaning a rose or a lily. OK, let's just share something else on that same idea that there's a suggestion also. It could be connected with the name Sasan, which means um, joy, because in Arabic and Hebrew, as we know, or they, uh, the Arabic languages, there isn't a single Arabic language, but Arabic and Hebrew, there are often connections between the two. There's another idea which I would like to share with you, okay, which is the concept of um, uh, the idea, just let me find it on my uh, handout here, um, the idea of in Tehillim. There's a, there's a chapter of Tehillim, chapter 60. OK, which starts with the words Lam Natsach al Shushan Eidos Michtam Le David, Le David Le Lamed. So why does it introduce itself as Shushan? So some people say this is a musical uh, instrument or a director to the musician of some sort, like we find in Tehillim sometimes, Lam um, Natsach al Shushan. Rashi brings a different explanation. Rashi says that it's referring to a historic event which took place at the time of King David, where King David had to consult the Sanhedrin. And he consulted the Sanhedrin about uh, um, uh, uh, dealing with a certain country called Aram Narai, which is um, in the Middle East. And he had to, it, the question was, was he allowed to attack that country because of the oath that had been made at the time of uh, Yaakov and Lavon? And the Sanhedrin gave him an answer. And the, um, the answer um, given by the Sanhedrin is described in this Tehillim. And that's why it's called Shushan, because the Sanhedrin spoke the truth. They spoke, the testimony was the testimony of truth. Okay, Mikhtam of David concerning the testimony of the Sanhedrin who are compared to a rose. Okay, and that's, that's a concept 
of, of truth and, and the judicial process of the Sanhedrin reaching its, uh, its conclusion. And that's why, that's a suggestion, that's why it's called Lam Natsech Ashushan Eidos Mikhtam Ladovet. Okay, let's go back to Megillus Esther. There's, there's a lot to sp speak about this, but we know that at the end of Megillus Esther, we sing the song Sheshanas Yaakov. Okay, which refers Shoshana Yaakov Tzalav Asamecha Berotam Yachat Tchelat Mordechai. The lily of Jacob rejoiced and was glad when Mordechai was seen in purple. Okay, so this is um, severally different, referred to the Jewish people, um, possibly to Esther, okay, um, individual, different commentaries on the Siddur, but it's very interesting that we take the Shoshan, okay, and we use that Shoshanas Yaakov. We take that same name and whoever wrote Shoshanas Yaakov, and I couldn't find out who wrote it. I tried to find out who wrote it. If anyone knows, please let me know. I don't know who wrote Shoshanas Yaakov, but I, I'm suggesting that possibly they developed that, that idea from the name Shoshan by putting the kind of its classic um, literary um, uh, a skill to bring two ideas into one word. So whilst it's referring to the lily of um, of, of the Jewish people, they're also incorporating that into Shush, the name Shoshanas Yaakov into the, with the word Shushan as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you a sh part of a video which gives you a little picture of what this looks like today, and then we'll come back with a final idea. Okay, so um, I'm just going to zoom some, do a different share, and I hope this works because I haven't done it for a while. And maybe somebody can just put on their... Um, put their thumbs up to say when they they can see the sound. I mean, they can hear the sound, I should say. Maps and models introduce us to one of the wonders of the ancient world. that is started to excavate it on the 19th century. We're coming back to the 1850 when an English guy coming here started to excavate it because they have read something about the traveler told about the Jewish people who live here. And we went to Hamadan, we saw this stair and Mordechai, and this, the story of the stair and Mordechai was, and the stair become the queen of Iran. So that ceremony is held here. So it shows that that's Our guide explains that this is the castle where the Old Testament personality Esther became queen. But this is also where the Old Testament prophets Daniel and Nehemiah lived out some of their life. The site is an active archaeological excavation. It was first examined in 1836 by an Englishman. Henry Rawlinson. Then further archaeological work occurred in 1851 to establish the identity of the site. In 1885 French archaeologists arrived and the French have continued to work on the site with interruptions for the two world wars. These low reconstructed walls mark out the sites of the King's Palace rooms. In fact the many rooms in the palace indicate that the design was much more Babylonian and Syrian than Iranian. In some places we are able to examine the palace foundations. By the time King Darius and his successors had completed their buildings, the site must have looked very, very impressive. Darius left records that every nation in the empire contributed to the building. In a famous inscription, Darius describes how Egypt supplied silver and ebony, Lebanon sent cedar, and ivory came from India and Kush. And as the king's winter capital, it accumulated great wealth. When Alexander the Great captured the city in 330 BC, he found 40,000 talents of precious metal in the treasuries. Mm -hmm. 
Unfortunately, the artefacts discovered here, and there have been a lot, have mostly ended up in French museums. Each part of the palace had its particular uses. This is believed to have been the area where the military rehearsed. Under the adjoining mounds of earth are the remains of the ancient royal city of Susha. Towering over the remains of the palace of Darius is Chateau de Morgan. This was built by the French archaeologist. Okay, so that's kind of um, going into something slightly different now. So I hope, hope you found that interesting. Okay, so just to finish off, uh, I'm going to share with you a beautiful idea which, is, which kind of connects up all the, the things that we are um, speaking about. Okay, so there is a verse in the book of Shir Hashirim where the name Shoshana appears a number of times. Okay, so we use this name, um, obviously, in many places. My, one of my daughters is called Shoshana. Okay, and if I can just find the verse for you, I'm not sure where I put it on my sheet, but it is, it says in Shir Hashirim, um, I'll just see if I can find it. Sorry about this. Chapter two, here it is. Okay. It says over here, make that a bit bigger for you. So it says, Kishoshana, um, Bain Hachachim, like a rose or a lily amongst the thorns, so is my beloved amongst the nations. So as we know that the Jewish people in Shirashirim, Shirashirim describes the relationship between God and the Jewish people, in which we are depicted as the, the lady, and Hashem is the man. Kishoshana, so is my beloved amongst the nations. This refers to the Jewish people, on which there's a very famous Rashi. Rashi says, Kishoshana Bain Hachachim, Shemenakvin Ursa that you have a rose amongst thorns. This is the origin of the expression. You have a rose amongst thorns. So um, it, the thorns prick the rose, okay? When it, which prick it? Because it constantly retains its beauty and its readiness. So is my beloved amongst the daughters. The nations torment B'nai Yisrael and Taisa, etc., to stray and to go for other gods, but she remains steadfast in her faith. That's a very famous Rashi, the idea that, um, that a rose can, can, can be there, it can get pricked and prodded, and it remains a rose. So that's the, the basic concept. I saw a development of this idea, which is beautiful and fits in with the story of Purim, which is that sometimes when the rose is there, and if you've got a rose bush, you can see this, we had some in our garden, we had to take them away. One of them was said to be, the garden told us over a hundred years old. Okay, and if you look at sometimes the rose gets torn by depending on how the, um, the thorns grow, the, the rose can get torn by the thorn, and by the thorn it can make holes in it. Very often that repairs itself quickly. The rose, the fabric, that soft felty fabric of the rose will repair itself quickly. And I, I saw an explanation in the safe of course, Shira David, that this is what Rashi is trying to tell us here. Rashi is saying that that's what the Jewish people are. Not only do we stand out and we remain who we are, but we actually repair ourselves very, very quickly. And we, the, the outer, sometimes we do suffer damage, but we have this God-given capacity to become, um, to go back and to become the rose again and the perfect rose. So that's what we see in the story of Esther. It fits perfectly because that's what happened. We know that the Jews were a bit wayward at the beginning. That's why the story happened. But by the time it comes to the end of the story, they'd re-accepted the Torah, they'd renewed their allegiance to God and that brought them into a, a good place, a very good place indeed. So that's the, that's like the rose repairing itself, even if it does take, sometimes it does take a prick and a prod, but it actually fully repairs itself. And I think that's a, a very beautiful idea to, uh, to conclude with. Okay. Anyone want to ask anything? Yeah, I've allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So, uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Simmons, for that very, very interesting talk about uh, Shoshan and Purim, etc. Has anyone got any questions, for Rabbi Simmons? Um, any comments? Has any, anybody actually been to Shoshan? Anyone been to Iran? I would love, I really would love to go. It's a sort of place I would love to go to. 
when I was in Israel a couple of weeks ago, I just, I, did, I always, I love walking around Jerusalem and I've just found two places that I've never, ever been to before. Just by walking, I found two yeah. places. So this kind of thing really connects me. Yeah. Okay. Has anyone got any, uh, Martin, you want to say something? Who are you saying? You're waving to, no, Martin? No, no. Oh, just uh, no. Uh, touching the screen. No. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Simmons, for that again. That was That's very, right. very interesting. Very, very uh, topical subject and uh, food for thought for, for Purim. Everyone have a have an enjoyable uh, Purim, a happy Purim, a happy Purim to everyone. Uh, just to say, um, there's a, an, an advert that we are... Um, uh, having an uh, we're having a an actual breakfast and learn on Thursday on Purim after the second uh, Shachris. Second Shachris at eight o'clock. After Shachris, we're having a breakfast, an actual breakfast. Uh, everyone's welcome to attend, and the guest speaker is Rabbi Yaakov Bennett, who you may recall was the rabbi at the Beit Linwood Minion. So he'll be speaking on Thursday morning. Everyone welcome. It's very much the last minute thing which we've just thought of uh, yesterday and today, but please do join us um, on Purim morning because you can't be drinking all day Purim, so you might as well have a bit of terror in the morning first anyway. And then next Tuesday, we're back again on Zoom with another speaker and I'll send out details to you um, later in the week. So thank you again, uh, Rabbi Simmons, for joining us all the way from Manchester. Have a good uh, Purim. Have a nice Purim, everyone, and we'll see you all. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.